listening to The Trident, a podcast on irregular warfare and related issues in the international security environment. The Trident is sponsored by the U.S. Naval War College's Center on Irregular Warfare and Armed Groups. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, retired Army Colonel Dave Brown and director of the Center on Irregular Warfare here at the college. Welcome to this special episode of The Trident in conjunction with our recent 2024 Maritime Symposium Exploring Maritime Strategies was held here on the 24th and 25th of June. And today we're discussing maritime security on shipping vessels in and around the Strait of Hormuz. My co-host today is Professor John Huggins. John's an Associate Professor for International Programs here at the college. He was the founding director of Oceans Beyond Piracy program during the height of the Somalia piracy crisis. His organization's research was featured on the BBC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Al Jazeera. And Oceans Beyond Piracy was also a key contributor to the assistance to release of 44 piracy hostages held in Somalia for almost four years. John later worked uh, across four different continents as a maritime security consultant for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, the International Maritime Organization, and the commercial shipping industry. He's a career Navy P-3 Naval Flight Officer, directed multi-squadron flight operations for Operation Enduring Freedom, and he's also served on the NATO and European Union military staffs in Brussels, 7th Fleet Headquarters, was also a federal executive fellow at the Atlantic Council and a member of the CNO's executive panel staff. And John, uh, thank you for joining me co-hosting this, uh, this episode. Thank you very much, Dave. All, also joining us is uh, Commodore Adrian Fryer, uh, Royal Navy, retired. Commodore Fryer had a 31-year 31 career, uh, career in the Royal Navy, a wide range of operational and academic experience. His sea commands, including Her Majesty's ship, the Tyne, on UK maritime security duties, uh, Her Majesty's ship Clyde in the South Atlantic and Falkland Islands, and a T-45 destroyer, well, you have the greatest ship names, the, Her Majesty's ship HMS Dauntless, which served as the air and missile defense to the USS Carl Vinson Carrier Battle Group um, conducting operations in the Gulf. Uh, his operational commands also include the first command of the International Maritime Security Constructed Coalition Task Force Sentinel in the Middle East. He was also the commander of UK forces and the UK Maritime Component Commander in the wider Middle East. And finally, he was the deputy commander of the Combined Maritime Forces, which was the world's largest naval operational partnership. He's an alumni of the Advanced Command and Staff Course in Shrivenham, England, He's also an alumnus of the Executive Alliance Business School in Manchester and a graduate, proud graduate of the U.S. Naval War College, where he later taught joint military operations. And John, thank you. I mean, uh, Adrian, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. We're also joined by Evan Kurt, and Mr. Kurt is the Deputy Commissioner for Maritime Affairs in the Republic of Marshall Islands, which flags a tremendous amount of maritime vessels. In 2012, Mr. Kurt joined International Registries Incorporated as a maritime services group, uh, as a maritime security investigations coordinator, was later promoted to ship security manager. Uh, he was further promoted to vice president of maritime security, dealing with ISPS code and related maritime security issues and other initiatives, including piracy, armed robbery against ships, maritime terrorism, stowaways, contraband smuggling, maritime cyber risk management. He serves as a delegate to many maritime security working groups uh, coordinated and supporting by the shipping industry associations and also NATO coalition naval forces and the International Maritime Organization. And Evan, we uh, welcome you, uh, welcome to each of you. So today's episode we've entitled The Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf. And maybe we can start by uh, discussing a little bit about the overall maritime situation in the Gulf over a number of years. Uh, Commodore Fryer, um, maybe talk to us about the waters there, how narrow the strait is, and what kind of uh, major incidents that we've been dealing with and for how long in the, in the Gulf. 
No, thank you, David. So it's, um, it's a huge topic. So I'll start by zooming out and then we'll, we'll look in. So um, the, the Persian Gulf is you know, part of the wider Middle East area and it really is the maritime crossroads of the world yeah. and it has been for, for millennia. Um, you know, a cradle of civilization. So there's so much history and tradition that goes into that particular area. Um, but looking at this on a modern day basis, the energy sector and the shipping sector that runs through that area is absolutely significant for global economy, global trade and, and stabilisation as well. So the, what's unique about the, the Persian Gulf is the Straits of Hormuz. Um, and there's one way in and, and one way out. And we look at the amount of trade that travels through that, it is really significant. So we're talking around about 20% of global trade by volume or, or petroleum by volume travels through the Straits of Hormuz. That equates to about 20 million barrels per day coming out of the Straits of Hormuz. So globally significant area. So is that mostly energy transports, Evan? And, or is it partly containerized traffic as well? Or? Well, there's a lot of containerized going into the Gulf, not much containerized coming out, a lot of energy coming out. And that energy is, is um, mainly oil, but also you have liquid, liquid petroleum and natural gas coming out as well. So and, and Evan, what are, so I, I think Adrian mentioned, what, what's the overall percentage of global shipping that comes in and out of the Strait of Hormuz? I'm actually not sure about that. I, well, the, the unique thing about the Strait of Hormuz is it doesn't have a pass-through. I mean, it, it's not like the, um, the other side where you can go through the Bab el-Mandeb and the Suez Canal. Um, so, so the Red Sea has a north and south entrance, but uh, exactly. Strait of Hormuz is a dead end. It's a cul-de-sac in, in some ways. And so once you get in there, if it gets shut down, you're in there. You're trapped. Okay. Yep. All right. And so go back to the, the, the significant amount of, of shipping that's there and what other aspects that we should understand about these waters? So I think the, the key thing is, as I said, there's you know, only one way in and one way out. So if you're in, you've got to get out. and you. Know, if you're out and you need to get in, there's only one way in. Um, the new, unique bit about it is the Straits of Hormuz, which we, we talk about a lot, but if you try and imagine the actual distance from the point of Oman to uh, the Iranian coastline. So where the canalization yeah, occurs so the, is the narrowest part yeah, of the Yeah, so the, the smallest bit. So if you look on a map, it doesn't look too, too narrow. It's about 21 miles from point of land to point of land, but, um, but the navigable waters within that is only about four miles itself. Wow. So there's only a four mile channel and that's split up between a one-way system, inbound and outbound. So there's two miles um, wide channel going in and two miles going out. So you know, if you think about all the trade that comes in and comes out, it all funnels through a very, very small bit of water going in and coming out. And that what Does it make it a very unique. crowded waterway? It, it yeah. is. It's really crowded. I mean, I've, I've sailed through there you know, countless times, and it is, it's almost been like in a traffic jam on a motorway. You, know, you are you know, lines and lines of ships coming in and coming out all the time. So it is very congested in that area. And I think when we talk about congestion, it's not just merchant vessel that is congested in that area, but there are a lot of other operators in that area, such as the military, um, and not just merchant vessels, but sh um, fishing vessels and other uh, craft as well. So it's a very congested area. So just trying to understand that is really difficult. And then what you add um, on top of that is it, it's also a contested area um, and that's what we'll talk about later why it's contested and if you have a you know a, a global hub a choke point that is very small you have the amount of shipping going through it and adding to that the strategic importance of it and then it becomes a contested area then you have a very very complex situation to try and deal with. John how, how long have we been dealing with maritime incidents in the Gulf? I think this has gone all the way back to the 1980s. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the staff here and others are familiar with what the so-called tanker wars uh, back in the 80s that were, were a problem. And it, and it has flared at different points throughout. I don't think it's ever been completely calm for commercial traffic. There's always been a high tension there. And as the Commodore was mentioning, you have this uh, route that is very narrow. It's controlled by a traffic separation scheme that they've tried to set up. But as we get into it, you'll see the uh, Iranians have used excuses such as unsafe procedures entering and other excuses for seizures and that type of thing. And I, just to, to add on to the importance of the Straits of Hormuz, uh, during the piracy crisis, the initial crisis was near the Red Sea, near Somalia. And a lot of that traffic was going to Europe. And so Europe was very involved. But as you move east across the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. 
a lot of that traffic out of the Straits of Hormuz is going to Korea and Japan mm -hmm. and east from there. So it, it is a worldwide problem. And did, can either one of you just give us a brief glimpse of kind of what happens in the tanker wars and what the actors played on that? Is that uh, yeah, of course. So that was, um, uh, again, Iran was the main protagonist there. Uh, it started off by, and we'll talk about swarm tactics and attacking tankers and what it led to as part of the sort of the wider Iran-Iraq war as well, was trying to close down uh, shipping routes going into into the Persian Gulf. So that was... So they couldn't load up with oil and come yes, back out? Yes, they couldn't load up and come back out, effectively, so, and stop sort of international trade as well. Um, that was a different scenario than we're looking at at the moment. Um, that was fueled by maybe something different. Um, but it became almost almost state on state because we were, we were you know, it was US ships and UK ships you know, heavily involved in that and that was proper kinetic warfare, more traditional type warfare that okay. we're used to and things have moved on quite a bit from then. And there were significant uh, casualties during that war. And what, so <clears throat> in the modern day instance, if you move that forward in time, uh, how long have we really, if, if you would put a, a window of time on the type of incidents that we're seeing today, what are those and how long have we been dealing with small boat craft, uh, IRGC, if you can explain some of that for us. So we've, we've never stopped dealing with it. Uh, you know, it's, it's like anything else, it sort of dips below the sort of the attention and then comes back up every so often. So you know, after the tanker wars, then it was a bit of a sort of a, a withdrawal and then build up of forces as, as always happens after something like that. But we've been dealing with the IRGCN sort of challenge since they were established in, in 1985. And we'll go on to discuss about that uh, a bit later. Um, but if we look more recently, the sort of the, the, the core problem set that we're looking at now that's manifested itself in the Red Sea, we can trace back to sort of early 2019 when Good. the IRGCN um, placed limpet mines on merchant vessels going in. And, and so we can separate the tanker wars to one bit, we can separate between sort of the, the 90s and, and Gulf Wars to an, another section. But I think now we're in a new area or a new era of you know, irregular warfare, and we can probably trace that back to. The most significant one is in 2019 with the limpet mines, and that's just escalated from today. And are, is this attempts to, I think uh, there were elements that were boarding ships um, or trying to seize cargoes or uh, energy vessels. Is that the type of incidents that uh, we're talking about? So there's a whole range of, of incidents, and Evan will be able to add much more to me about the, the seizure of ships and the reasons for that. So there are more targeted reasons for seizure of ships, but also targeted reasons for, for attacking ships. So I'll, I'll just briefly discuss what the situation is from 2019 with the, with the limpet mines. And they, you know, it depends where, where you sit and where you stand, as, you know, how you perceived whether they were targeted particularly or not, or whether they were just targets of, of opportunity. Um, but in 2009, limpet mines were placed on, on vessels going in to the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, and from there, the tactics have, have developed. So they've gone from limpet mines. How do they how do they attach the mines? So basically, mm -hmm. um, at certain points, merchant, merchant ships move faster and slower through the Straits of Hormuz. Sometimes they've got to hold in anchorages in the Gulf of Oman uh, and move in, etc. Um, but majority of merchant ships move around about between twelve and sixteen knots as they're going through through the Straits, which which is not really fast, and the waters are quite calm. So you can approach these quite easily on speedboats, and that's where the IRGCN have built up their tactics over uh, you know, a period of time. So, so those first limpet mines were the IRGCN, and we call them sp speedboats for want of a better word. They are you know, warships, but much, much smaller. Um, and they're basically nothing, nothing more um, technical than just someone lifting up a limpet mine and driving a speedboat alongside a ship and, and magnet, you know, magnet and putting it on and, and, and riding away. It's sometimes as simple as that, mm. and that can have such devastating effect. And did they sink ships uh, with these mines? Or? So no, not with that one. So they, the mines did explode, um, but luckily that ship was in ballast, um, and where they were placed weren't in you know, really significant areas, but they did create you know, significant damage to those ships, but the size of those ships, it didn't really have an impact. If, you know, better tactics and more knowledge would cause more significant mm -hmm. damage. And Evan, what about the ship seizures? Um, yeah, so more recently, uh, it's been linked to sanctions. Um, more U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil. Um, the Suez Rajan last year was uh, was 
I guess, arrested or confiscated by the U.S. It was asked to come back, and they did so compliantly, uh, or voluntarily, uh, to Houston and the U.S. So it's a ship trying to run, kind of a busting the sanctions. We've got sanctions. We're trying to prevent them from selling on the market, and uh, we're trying to tell a ship, hey, you, you can't violate this sanction, and we're stopping the ship or seizing it. So in this case, the ship was owned by Greeks and a U.S. investment company. So that's really the link. You know, um, U.S. companies can't do this. Um, they were caught doing it. You know, they admitted to it. Um, they actually pled guilty. Um, but they also got their oil taken uh, by the U.S., um, which went to 9-11 victims, I believe. Um, but when the ship was released, Iran, the, the ship, I don't know, I, I can't explain why it went back to that area, um, but it did. It changed its name, went back to the area, mm. and now it's St. Nicholas, and the Iranians took it. Um, that was... In retaliation? Yes. In okay. reta yeah. Um, but, but before that, they took another ship called Advantage Suite, um, that was right after they found out the U.S. was confiscating their oil. Uh, so they've got two ships of ours, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, two Marshall Islands flagships there, uh, as well as a Panamanian ship, Neovi, and uh, recently MSC Ares. So they have four ships there um, keeping Bandar Abbas now. So from Iran's standpoint, are they, what are their motivations? What is it that they're wanting, have they, they've threatened to shut down the strait entirely at times, have they not? This is, uh, and, and just to go back with the, with the tactics, uh, we mentioned the limpet mines. They've also done intimidation to try to uh, uh, seize the vessel for safety violations or collisions supposedly with Iranian fishing vessels. We've seen a helicopter attack. Trumped up charges right. in some ways as an excuse to, exactly. to board or, or seize a ship. They'll say they have Iranian court orders to seize um, UK and US associated vessels but we've also seen a helicopter attack uh, against the MSC Ares. We saw a UAV attack against the Mercer Street, which um, tragically killed two people. Uh, that was back in 2021. That was from a UAV. So we have seen a variety of tactics, and actually probably Commodore can talk more to uh, other modes. But to get into the motivations, this was a, a big discussion we had at the symposium mm. about uh, whether or not U.S. Uh, aggressive enforcement of sanctions is having this knock-on effect, the tit-for-tat, where uh, U.S.-linked or U.K.-linked um, uh, vessels are being seized, mm. and whether the U.S. actions have made commercial shipping more vulnerable. Uh, so that's, a, that's a more of a policy question, but that was something we covered during the discussion as well. And not everybody's in alignment with U.S. sanctions regimes at times. I mean, uh, we saw that in the Gulf War. We had some of our own allies at times uh, trying to trade with Iraq. And so uh, sometimes our international partners um, are not thrilled with our uh, use of sanctions as a wide variety of economic leverages against other states, in this case, Iran. But let's go back to talking about maybe the IRGC and the IRGC in for a minute. So this is the Islamic Revolutionary uh, Republican Guards Navy, which is different from the Iranian Navy in some ways. So they're two, they, it's almost like they have two different navies, and, uh, and one of them, uh, look, tell us something about that uh, in terms of. So, so you're right, Dave. So there are two, two distinct areas of you know, maritime forces that the okay. that Iranian, Iranians use, um, and that makes it more challenging. Um, some, sometimes you can be predictable, and, but having two makes it a little bit more unpredictable. So, so there are two. One is the Iranian Navy, which you know, we look at in its more of a traditional navy. Um, that's known as the sort of Artesh Navy in the local area. And that is, you know, if you look at that, that's you know, made of normal warships that we would say that's a navy. And that is designed to uh, operate in the Caspian Sea and the Gulf of Oman and you know, try and push further afield. So, so it's more of a blue water... Navy, and they're attempting so to their, their sail farther So their aspiration is to be a right. blue water navy. Now, a blue water navy has different um, you know, context as well, but that's their aspiration to push out to be a, a blue water navy. Um, and that follows the normal structure of a navy, and that's predictable and understandable, and has certain you know, lines of command, etc., that you can you can follow. <coughs> um, but separately, as you've highlighted, David, is the 
the IRGCN Navy, uh, more locally known as the SEPA Navy, which was established in 1985 as a direct order of the Iranian Supreme um, Commander at at the time, and that's a completely different. So it's chain not a command. Coast Guard. It's not a Coast Guard, no. So it's um, it's very different from a Coast Guard, set up differently, and it was set up to be an irregular asymmetric tool that the Supreme Commander can use outside the Navy. Um, so operate below the sort of the the threshold that we we often talk about, and to be very flexible and agile. And it's made up of five districts. So in in theory, the idea is that it looks after. You know, maritime security in the Persian Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz, that's their intended intended use. Um, but it does a lot more, a lot more than that. It is designated as a terrorist organization. Uh, it uses a different type of sort of you know, irregular warfare and asymmetric warfare than we're used to seeing at sea. Um, but I think more importantly, they are you know, unpredictable because of their different chain of command. There's quite a bit of autonomy in the five districts. Um, and it depends what day you catch them on as to what, what they will do on any given moment as well. And that makes them you know, more unpredictable and more difficult to, to mitigate and deal with. So instead of these uh, larger warships, uh, probably we would think for most of the world, uh, um, uh, corvettes or frigates, destroyer perhaps, <coughs> subs, this IRGC Navy has, as you described them, large, fast, smaller patrol boats, armed patrol boats that have done intimidation tactics. Um, how does that work? What kind of, what kind of things do they do? What, what are those tactics and how dangerous are they? So I'll just um, get a little bit about the structure of them there. So we, you, you're right, David. We look at a traditional navy as corvettes, frigates, destroyers, aircraft carriers, submarines, etc. Very high quality, very expensive bits of equipment that do specific things at the high end of warfare. Um, what the IRGCN concentrates on is that below that sort of area. So they are made up of um, you know, what we would initially look at as lesser capable craft. But qu quantity has a quality all of its own in this one. They have so a lot of them. They have a lot of them. <clears throat> um, you know, they have, you know, ranging their bigger craft around about 600 tonnes, their sort of multi-hulled catamarans, newly built fast craft. Um, they can be used as their command and control platforms and they have you know, missiles or surface-to-surface -surface missiles as well. So, so quite capable craft at the high end, but only 600 tonnes, so not big, big ships. Um, and then we look you know, f further down, they have around about the 200 tonne mark, they have what they call their fast attack craft. Um, and you'll see pictures on them, but they are you know, missile launchers. You think back to sort of tactics in World War II where it was, you know, go in fast, launch your torpedoes, launch your missiles and get out. That's a sort of fast attack craft that, that they've got over there. Um, and they're again a lot of very capable units and, you know, quite a decent range they've got for their missiles as well, so very difficult to deal with. But then we go even lower again and they have, you know, what we classify as their fast inshore attack craft, which um, mm. you, know, you could call speedboats. You look at them, it's a, it's a fast speedboat. So these boats are capable of 40, 50, 60 knots, which you equate that, that's you know, 60, 70, almost 80 miles an hour, given the sea state. Um, and they have, again, surface-to-surface -surface missiles on them. They have rocket-propelled grenades on them. They have rocket launchers. They're capable of laying mines. They have um, large caliber machine guns. So very potent in their own um, individual unit itself. But then when I said before, quantity has a quality, you know, the best estimates, they've got between 3,000 and 5,000 of these. You know, that's, that's a lot. Wow. Um, and dealing with that is a, a real challenge. And to go back to you know, how they use them is their swarm tactics. So, you know, if, you, if they send two or three or four at a time, then you know, that's, you, know, you, you can deal with that. But if they send in 100, that's a completely different challenge that you've got. But even if you were to try to interdict them, mm. it's, that's a difficult process. I, I, understood that it's hard to even hit a craft that's moving, a smaller craft that's moving in the water um, to relative to the sea state, um, difficult targets and difficult to deal with in terms of what they're doing to either safety and good order or to harassment um, or to actual lethal attack. It is, and there's a whole, whole range of sort of um, you know, levels of war we're talking about there from just general harassment um, through to sort of coercion and sort of inciting terror through to physical attacks and conducting warfare. And they all require different um, 
uh, actions by, by whoever is on the, the other side of it, whether it be a warship or a merchant ship, etc. And that's part of the challenge because they have a, these, these FIAC, these speedboats, have an almost constant presence in the Straits of Hormuz. So every mm. time you, you drive a ship through the Straits of Hormuz, you will see these craft um, and they, they will approach ships. They're now, fairly but, close anyway fairly close, in the yeah. narrower yeah. portion of the Strait. Yeah. And you know, we all at sea abide by rules of the road for safety and navigation. Um, but these vessels don't, they will just approach you straight away. So the challenge you've got is what is their intent? Yeah, what's the, is, yeah, the, what is that, that a threat? Are, is uh, that is that it a threat? Are they coming yeah, out yeah. just to, to have a look at you, to see who you are, to read the name of the ship and then report that back in? Or are they coming out to, to test your resolve with rule of the road you know, and navigational safety? And John mentioned they can, they can create that sort of false impression and then try and claim that you've been unsafe in your actions, but they've created it to begin with. Um, or they can come out in a larger group and see what reactions you take, whether you take a defensive stance or offensive stance, etc. And then you know that keeps on going on and on. And certainly in the in the military world, if you're driving a warship through, if something comes within two miles of you, you know that's classed as quite a quite a big threat. If they keep coming, then your level of threat internally increases. Um, but to a point where at some point they will know where your limitations are and you know, generally turn away at the last moment to test your resolve as a, as a military ship going through. Now, Evan, and so our symposium was looking at two different regions. One was the Red Sea and one's the Persian Gulf. In the Red Sea, there was a recent attack with, I, I, from I gathered, a maritime unmanned uh, drone of sorts or a, a ship laden with explosives that was piloted into a, a merchant vessel, exploded. And um, is the IRGC experimenting with these type of uh, entities as well in terms of technology? It is. So you know, we said at the start that they started off with limpet mines and that's progressed and progressed and progressed. And um, certainly out throughout 2021, 20, uh, we saw the development of tactics take on the next level, um, which is where the real challenge becomes. So. You know, one, there's a very real threat from the IRGCN itself with their swarm tactics, with their speedboats and fast inshore attack craft. Um, you know, but if they do that, we can say, you know, IRGCN did it because you can see their speedboats, you can see what they're doing. So that's all accountable back to the IRGCN. Once you start to bring in autonomous vessels and drones and, and unmanned, uncrewed vehicles, whether it be seaborne or airborne, then it's quite difficult then to um, say who that threat came from, yeah, but, but we can. So we saw this threat develop in throughout 2020 with the development of, of drones. We saw the tactics develop uh, just from launching drones and uh, you know, and we're talking, when I say drones now, it's not the drones that you, you operate at home like a little quadcopter right. without, they right. are, you know, they are quite, um, quite complicated aircraft effectively. Um, they're almost a, a winged missile. Um, you know, significant range and capable of carrying a payload of around about 50 kilograms, which is, which is quite significant. So we saw that threat sort of build up and definitely the IRGCN develop its tactics throughout 2021. Um, you know, we spoke to John about earlier, the first you know, proper um, development ahead of that is when they hit the, the Mercer Street in, in 2021 with the unfortunate death that that involved as well. So then what we saw then is that was, that happened much further out of the Straits Hall moves than we thought was capable. So they're spreading their sort of um, area of operations further and further out. So that was the first development. And that one was three drones launched. You know, and you know, we can talk about tactics separately for that one, but, um, but an absolute step change in capability to conduct terror at sea outside their own immediate area. So what, what you know, how big are these waters in terms of if they are expanding that range outside the mouth of the <coughs> Persian Gulf itself and you have either international warships or a flotilla trying to patrol that area? I mean, what kind of area are we talking about? So the area itself is huge. Um, you know, we, we spoke about how small the Straits for Moose are, and that's a different challenge because it's so small. Right. When you talk about, you know, large-scale areas, that's really difficult to, to sort of... Um, you know, use police for a want of a, a better word, but it, it drives to a, a quite a good analogy, is the, the whole area of the Middle East we're looking at is around about, about 3 million square miles. Now that includes Gulf of Aden, Bab Man of Straits, Red Sea, etc. Um, but if you look south from the Gulf of Oman down to the Seychelles and the Indian Ocean, 
you're probably looking at about you know 1.8 million square miles, which is a huge area. And if you you, you sort of um, you view that the size of continental US, which is about 3.2 million square miles, you get some sense of the area that we're looking at. So the challenge is, how do you be in the right place at the right time to counter all these sort of um, operations that the IGCN are doing at range? And that's a really difficult thing. Um, so let me turn to Evan for a minute. And just so Iran seems to be the, one of the major aggressive players in, in these waters. But they benefit from the trade, particularly sell of oil um, coming out of, of uh, the Persian Gulf. Why would they harass shipping? And I mean, what's their, what do they gain out of that when it's limiting their commerce and, and oil revenues? Well, it's, a, it's really a tit for tat, but it's also to show that they control um, that area. Basically, they, they believe so it's a constant, can, it's a deterrent threat in some ways. They, they, they can constantly intervene anytime they want to. Yeah. They, and they want everyone to know that. Yeah, and they also have very good intel. So it's not like the Houthis, the Houthis try, um, but Iran knows what they're doing. And so they, are Houthis a little bit more indiscriminate because yes. they don't have the same technology. Iran is playing a more sophisticated for sure. game and, for targeting or for their tactics. Yeah, and then they'll know cargoes, and not only the, the ownership of ships, but the charters of those ships and, and who's carrying it, and if they're American or not. So um, they can hit us back economically if we keep taking their oil. It, it's a zero-sum. It, so during the Iranian-Iraqi uh, war, you know, they're obviously trying to interdict and affect their adversary that lives in those same waters, or players on the side of the Arabian Gulf, <laughs> um, as it were. Um, but now uh, that conflict has more or less gone away. And you're really talking about international shipping. Um, and of course, uh, there's a large task force of warships and protection to these shipping lanes because we feel it's a vital shipping lane. Is that close to being it, it, it is it's it's, it's spot on David the um, yes yeah, so there's just two things and we're focusing in on the the threat to the the maritime trade aspect as well but the you must forget that underlying all this if you hint at there is the regional competition within that area um, and that goes back to, from millennia um, mm -hmm. you know and what each you know regions nations sort of desired sort of position in the world is plays into all of this as well so so what we're seeing now, it, although, although you know, really, really important, is still a symptom of you know, regional competition in the area and who vies for who is sort of the, the most influential country in that area as well, which Iran is trying to do with control over the Straits of Hormuz and by proxy over control of the Straits of uh, Bab Mandeb. Um, but you're right, so lots of other players in this area. Um, if we look at the region itself and we go back to sort of military, sort of navy uh, plays in the area. You've got all the the regional nations. So you have you have Iraq, you have Kuwait, you have Saudi Arabia, you have UAE, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, you, and, and that's that's a lot of navies in one small area. And then you add on top. And of Bahrain that, is also where we have our regional navy yeah, so, headquarters. Yeah, so Bahrain well. is where uh, U.S. Fifth Fleet Nav Center and the U.K. Component Command is is headquartered as well. You're kindly hosted by Bahrain, which is in a very central position of the uh, of the uh, Arabian Gulf. Um, so if you mention all the local regional players, then you have the, the big international you know, um, players there as well. So obviously the US, which you mentioned, and, and the UK. But then you, because it's, as we said right at the beginning, that area is of such strategic importance that anything that happens in that area has ripple effects throughout the world. So almost every country is interested in what happens in the maritime area there. So. To go back to how congested it is, it's not just Iran and regional navies and US and UK. It's also headquartered in Bahrain. There's the Combined Maritime Forces, which is uh, an organization made up of 44 different countries from all over the world, from Canada down to Brazil and Japan down to, down to Australia and 40 countries in between. So, so you've got all that in the mix as well. Now how many ships is that? Is so that varies on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, so there's permanent presence from all the regional players in the area. Um, 
you know, and they have a variety of scales, same as around us from sort of you know mid-sized Corvettes through to, to sort of faster craft. Um, and then from the sort of the larger, more traditional ones, obviously US permanent presence, UK permanent presence. Uh, and then other ships come in and go out from all the other uh, member states of the combined maritime forces. So you could on any one day have you know, you know, a hundred regional ships available in the Gulf, not always at sea, um, but then you could have you know up to twenty, thirty, sometimes forty. Where, where do they home port? Where do all those ships home port? At? So, so the regional navies home port in their own okay. in their own naval bases. Right. Uh, right. So that's fine. So a lot of the UK and the US ships, the what the stationed out there, permanently home port in Bahrain, although the US and the UK has sort of a their own permanent bases there. Um, other ships that come in and come out, they go on what we call traditional deployments. So leave their country of origin, you know, transit over to the Middle East, spend you know, two, three, four, five, six months in the Middle East, and then go back to their own countries and then replaced by by other ships. And they they use sort of Bahrain as their sort of pseudo headquarters uh, to come in. And, and you were the you were the commander of the Combined Maritime Force yes. when you were there. Yeah. John, what about some of the operations? We've got some standing operations that have tried to do different things. Can can you t uh, talk us through a couple of those? Yeah, I was, I was just going to talk about that. Actually, the Commodore and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, first of all, with CMF, although it's a very large organization, uh, and the Commodore has a term that he uses, but basically the national interests of those nations trumps the CMF mission. Okay. So if they don't feel like this is what they want to participate in. Today I'm out. Yeah, right. they're out. So you have CTFs in the, the Red Sea. There's also one uh, in the Persian Gulf. Um, but, um, and that's why I think, you know, you've also have uh, European missions there. And this is, uh, we talked about the long-term nature of this problem, this, pro this uh, challenge since the 80s. So already, and, and just today, uh, MSO, which is the EU mission for maritime awareness in the Straits of Hormuz, announced that it was going dormant. Uh, the International mm -hmm. Maritime Security Construct, of which uh, the Commodore was the uh, commander, that is uh, somewhat going dormant, although it still is, <coughs> is there in name. So, you know, what kind of message does that send, which I think, you know, is all the action has moved to the other side um, w over in the Red Sea, and we have so many assets there. So. Um, I think these things, you know, could send possibly the wrong message. Uh, we also have the Djibouti Code of Conduct and some other regional uh, cooperation networks, but so far they have not been willing to get involved in, in either one of these in a significant way. So I think that makes it a challenge. And the politics there, the way that they've been able to politicize this uh, in such a way that you're either with Israel or you're with us, uh, makes it very difficult for some of these nations to participate. But we have some named operations, right, that, that we routinely conduct? We do. Um, and just go back to, to John's point about, you know, the, the partnerships. You know, partnerships are really, really powerful. Um, but they have to, have to, at some point, be backed up by, by action. Um, and if you don't back it up by action, then, you know, then over time... And political will, will by each of the individual will. countries. Yeah, right? and to go back to, to, to John's point, so the... So IMSC, the International Maritime Security Construct, and the MSO were established at more or less the same time in 2019 after the, uh, the limpet mine uh, attacks there, um, but set up on two different mandates. The IMSC was focused uh, to be a state-facing organization, so back to your point about political mandates, they're at the foundation for everything that the military uh, can, can operate within. So IMSC was set up as a state-facing organization to counter the Iranian threat going through the Straits of Hormuz. Um, as such, only countries joined IMSC that were happy to say, you know, Iran are bad, uh, on a public, on a political stage as well. AMSO was set up to do the same thing, but not as a state-facing organisation. So it was made up of countries that... Explain uh, that term, state-facing. So, uh, so, so state-facing is the ability to use an organisation or your own nation's political um, influence to say, Iran conducted those those operations and call out Iran on the world stage. So the countries that joined IMSC, obviously, you know, US, uh, UK, um, Saudi, um, and a so it's a diplomatic narrative. It's diplomatic, similar. No, well, that's right. the very foundation of it. Um, but to have the same, to try and have the same overall impact of safety of shipping going through the Straits of Hormuz, but state facing is saying Iran did it. So the MSO was doing exactly the same thing, but they weren't built on the same mandate to be state-facing, so they would never mention 
Iran in any of their um, you know, public publications they, they made at all. It was all about safety of shipping at sea, which is obviously vitally important, but not saying that it was caused by Iran. So again, the political mandate is different. And going back to John's point earlier about CMF, the sometimes the beauty about partnerships is you bring what you feel comfortable in bringing, and we won't ask you to bring any more of that. And that's a really delicate balance to have. Um, and we see that with CMF, which we have to sort of build up you know, that understanding amongst everyone there that we'd rather have you as a willing partner and do as much or as little as you wish than say, well, if your mandate doesn't agree with ours, then you, then you can't join. And we're seeing that with the success of CMF over years, it's actually starting to grow now. And as John said, it's split up into, at the moment, four different task forces within CMF. So you have Task Force 150, which is concentrating on the sort of the Gulf of Amman and countering illegal drug smuggling. And so that's mainly an anti-smuggling anti -smuggling, yep. orientation. And that's not state facing because okay. yeah, smuggling, everyone will agree that smuggling drugs right. is bad. Crime. Um, crime. So, and then Task Force 151, which obviously John has, has dealt with an awful lot before, uh, set up a, you know, to be counter piracy in the Gulf of Aden. Everybody will agree piracy is bad, so everybody feels comfortable right. contributing. You've uh, worked in that field for a while. With, yeah, yeah. yeah. Certainly. There's a lot. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Um, and then Task Force 152, which is um, looking inside the Arabian Persian Gulf at maritime security in there. And we try and use the regional players to, to do that one. And then we set up 153 back in 2022, as we saw the threat start to develop in the Red Sea. So that was a focused Red Sea, and that's now turned into Operation Prosperity Guardian. Uh, which is the focused operation on deterrence and assurance of merchant vessels through through the rest. So 152 is really oriented in some ways on this issue of IRGC Navy that's conducting small boat tactics, harassment issues, safety and security at sea governance in that area. Well, let's go to 153 for a minute. So there's Prosperity Guardian. Um, this is the linkage to the Red Sea. Uh, so Iran is... Uh, at some level, some directly, some indirectly, a supporter of the Houthi attacks that are happening in the Red Sea. And I am assuming that they are also uh, giving arms and particularly sophisticated weaponry or some weaponry or components that the Houthis can assemble, as Nadwa talked to us about earlier. Um, how hard is it to interdict that and what is the linkage between what we're seeing in the flows out of the Persian Gulf uh, that are impacting this more immediate problem in, in the Red Sea waters? So I'll talk about the, the tactics and the sort of the reasons behind that. Um, so, so you're right, you know, absolutely. We, we can draw very, very direct lines between what is happening in the Southern Red Sea, Red Sea, Babmandab Straits, Houthis acting as a proxy organization for for Iran. Um, but now you've also increased the size of that waterway. Yeah, you massively. So now, yeah, now yeah, you've got yeah. millions of miles of ocean to, yeah, yeah. So just, to sort through. So, right? yeah, so just the the ge geographical distance between the Straits of Hormuz and the Bab al Straits takes a ship about four days to get from one to the other. So it, it's, it's, a long, it's a long way. And you can only have one ship in one place at, at one time. So it's a, a balance of resources from one to the other. Um, but to go back to your point about you know, what has developed in the Straits of Hormuz to how that has materialized itself in the Balamandeb Strait, I think is really important. And as I said earlier on, you know, we saw tactics develop um, from the Mercer Street in, in 21 using, you know, airborne, unmanned, you know, you know aircraft effectively to hit them. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing now. Exactly the same technology, exactly the same tactics being employed in the Balamandeb Strait. Um, so they've taught them how to uh, do Absolutely. This, right? They're taught, taught okay. and provided um, equipment and, and it, advisors. Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, and in in my time out there, we we spent quite a a large effort in physically interdicting the transshipment of these high quality missiles. So we're not talking about shiploads of AK forty sevens. That still happens and still really important. We capture those um, and stop that that route. Um, but what we saw from twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, there is a an uptick in very high um, quality technical shipments going across into the Houthis, which are the components for these uh, airborne missile systems. And that could get worse. I mean, there was some, yeah, I don't know if it was intelligence, but there was some rumor that the Houthis could 
might have gotten their hands on hypersonic missiles. So if the Russians were to have sold something to Iran or someone else got something that could breach uh, U.S. warship defenses and it got in the hands of the Houthis, I mean, this would be a huge game changer. Well, let's just go back and talk. I know you talked about this at the symposium, but I was fascinated by this. You know, how hard is it? I mean, uh, uh, Captain Joe Baggett was with us this morning uh, talking about uh, the Red Sea and uh, the difficulty of the fishing vessels. There's yeah. so many of them out there, and you don't know what's on which one. And they say it's on a shipping vessel, and you're like, where? where you know, where? You know, there's so many of them out here. Um, how difficult is this? You're talking about the, the waterway, the size of it, um, smaller smuggling traffic. Yeah, it's, it's and really so complicated. So 151, the 151 yeah. task force, is, is that tied into 153 because of that? So, so they are, so 151 and 153 operate on different mandates. Okay. 151 is counter piracy. So it's um, just looking purely at piracy. And we ask countries, so at the moment you have Brazil in command of task force 153. Maybe so I was thinking of 150, was it? So 150, so smuggling. So yes, so smuggling. So, okay. so yes, it is, it is tied in and it's all, you know, interlinked. Um, but then when you talk about smuggling drugs, and you mentioned it before, that's okay. a crime that we can all agree to. It's a bad thing. No, nobody wants drugs smuggled around. Um, and we can do that because it's the right thing to do. And every country will think that is the right thing to do. Um, but intercepting high advanced conventional weapons at sea that are going from one state to another proxy organization, you similar tactics, but actually you are now becoming a state facing organization. Um, and that's where the ability and one of the benefits of CMF and CTF is that we can use the same assets, but then chop them to national command and control to conduct those much more high intensity operations. So you were the commander of CMF. Did yeah. that mean like get to headquarters and say, OK, these five ships are going to go out to this task force. We're going to keep these 15 doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely, and you're yeah, kind yeah. of rotating that concept yeah. all the time in terms of these different missions or you yeah. get some intelligence. Um, and whatever that means, either out of shipping industry or from national assets, and realize yeah. that something dangerous is heading in a certain direction, um, and yeah, then it, you're, yeah, you're yeah, trying yeah, to yeah, find yeah, it yeah, um, yeah. Uh, out on these it, it is, waters. It, it, it is immensely complex. Um, so, if you look at the very sort of the final stages of any interdiction operation, you've got to get somehow you've got to get one of your people on board that ship to, to lift the covers and, and say, right, we've got it, and, and physically take control of it. Uh, but to get to that point in, you know, in time and a particular position geographically takes immense resources and, and planning uh, and you know, high fidelity skill sets sat behind it as well. So, I think you were saying, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the symposium where you had like a fast sea vessel, maybe yeah. faster than the warship, yeah. and you're putting a helicopter in the air, and you have to stop that ship while it's in international waters, and as soon as it gets in some national waters, you may not have jurisdiction, and you only have... You have minutes to... Minutes yeah, before yeah, they cross yeah. that into yeah. an area that you can no longer... You know, it's like getting near a state border and the state police are chasing you or something. It, it is, so you are chasing the same line. <laughs> you know? And it's, yeah, you hinted at the challenge there is that um, we spoke earlier on about the speed of these speedboats. They're, they're faster than warships, so so warship can't chase it. So you've got to understand everything that has led you to that point in time, get the warship and the right warship with the right training and the right people on board and the helicopter and the whole command and control and the rules of engagement. How do you stop the, the ship? So, so it's difficult. So there are many ways to, to stop, stop a ship. Certain countries can use certain amounts of force because that's in your own national mandate of how much force you can use in any part of the world. Um, and that's set by a political mandate as well. So we're right back to the political mandate. Um, obviously, the US, the UK, and France can use slightly higher uh, levels of force there. Um, but the challenge is stopping the ship. So yes, even everything we've spoken about, even if you get a warship, the right warship, with correct trained people in the right place at the right time, and all everything that's led to you finding this speedboat, um, if it's behind it, it'll never catch it. So you use helicopters, you use speedboats, it's got to be in front. Um, you know, and these speedboats, as you said, John, you know, David, they've got a you know, a finite bit of water to cross at high speed before they're, they're safe, and they know that. Um, so you can call them up on radio and ask them to stop. Yeah, and they're not going to stop. Right. Um, so you've got to use some coercion to make them stop. 
um, you know, they're not going to be coerced. Shoot over their bow. Kind of so you can start all that. You can shoot over the bow. But in reality, if okay. they're doing 50, 60 knots through the water and you shoot a, you know, even a 760 or a 5 calibre round in front of it, they're not going to see. They're just going to take their chances and go. So, so then we're talking about you know, really exceptional capability right at the high end of warfare is using snipers from aircraft which are tracking a you know, speedboat moving 50, 60 miles an hour uh, and putting a round through an engine casing which is literally, you know, you know, 24 inches in diameter that's traveling 60 knots and disabling that engine. And that's that split second in time. And you, to do that, you've probably only got about a window of 30 seconds. So everything I've spoken about up until that point, you've got 30 seconds to be right place, right time, right authorities, the right sniper sat there saying, on the phone saying, he's happy to do it. Well, and of course, you know, that falls into the realm of irregular warfare yeah. on the exquisite, uh, you know, we talk about exquisite technology, you know, uh, SEAL units, other, you know, very, very specialized units that can conduct very specialized operations uh, in targeted strike capability yeah. at sea, in the air. That's a very, very difficult uh, exercise. Or yeah, extremely training, difficult, so, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, let's go back and just talk a little bit about, so, you know, one is there is this difficulty of good order at sea, um, the governance of the strait, um, an immensely important waterway, but now we also have uh, the smuggling of high impact weapons and exasperating the situation that we've talked about in uh, the, the Red Sea, and a non-state actor that, according to our Iranian expert or our Houthi experts, the Houthis are not overly beholden to Iran, um, or not, and Iran is not necessarily in control. Um, Evan, you know, in terms of global shipping, uh, this is a serious problem still, um, and it could get worse. It, it could certainly get worse, and what we're worried about now, or a lot of our, our owners are worried about, is is going there and not having the protection they thought they had prior to the Houthi conflict. Um, you know, and I, I don't know where the assets are, but I would think that a lot of them have gone over there or to Israel or to other areas of the world. Um, but just to reiterate, so the, the amount of traffic has lessened through the Red Sea significantly. Yeah, a lot of our, our um, charters and owners won't go there right now uh, because they know they're a target. If you know that you've, you're carrying American oil, so the percentage of traffic uh, has lessened to what degree in uh, going through the Suez Canal? And that one's really hard. To, it's not as easy as the Red Sea to calculate that, I think. Um, well, through the Red Sea, then. Oh, through the Red Sea, the, the um, traffic's gone down by 60%. By 60%. Yeah. And so. a lot of that's commodity uh, <coughs> and bulk, bulk cargo and commodity shipping. Mm -hmm. LNG's gone to zero. Okay, uh, LNG's gone to zero. Yeah. And the revenue, at least for Egypt and coming out of Suez, has dropped considerably. Mm -hmm. um, 50%. 50%. And the cost of cargo containers, uh, the spot rate on those containers has spiked. And according to some of the industry uh, trade papers, is going to continue to rise. It may. I'm not sure about that. I think it, it okay. tends to to plateau and level out. Um, if they, you know, it, it depends though. Um, it, things could get worse and worse. And um, you know, oil prices. I mean, the bunker prices are are a lot more when you go around the Cape. Uh, it's about I think it's over a thousand miles extra. Um, so this is significant cost for shippers. And so there's a lot of political issues here. There's sanctions against Iran and Iranian oil. Um, they're selling it to China. And there's other players. India is buying still, I think, quite a bit of Iranian oil. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that issue in how the global oil market works um, in terms of the energy flows around the world. Um, it's hard to predict some of that because of the way the, the oil market works. And then you have global shipping for bulk cargo and containerized traffic, which fills Walmarts and other uh, homeowner building, you know, building construction costs, all sorts of things around the world. Um, what's the long-term impact to 
global maritime commerce, because global maritime commerce is still, you know, a huge uh, amount of the world's global sh uh, in entire infrastructure, and we move almost everything by sea, or a very, very large percentage of things by sea. What's, what's the long-term impact here uh, on the economic system? I think it's an uh, interesting t statistic. I think five years ago, the U.S. imported 20% uh, of its oil from uh, the Strait of well, the Persian Gulf area. Um, now it's only 10%. So um, the impact wouldn't be, you know, outrageous um, for the U.S. Now the impact for the rest of the world, a lot of uh, you know, China, for instance, or India, um, if they if they shut down the Strait of Hormuz, you know, it's a huge impact for them. And of course, Saudi is a huge player here as well because they're one of the, the world's largest uh, producers of oil, and I'm sure are shipping massive quantities out of Persian Gulf on a daily basis, I guess. Um, but um, what's at stake here in terms of other aspects of either dealing with better issues, uh, dealing with Iran itself, dealing with the IRGC, um, Navy. Um, John, what's at stake here in terms of... Well, there's, there's a few issues. things we talked about in the group. And I think, you know, to get to what is the impact on shipping, um, this probably isn't a popular answer here, but I think some of the U.S. sanctions enforcement has mm -hmm. made commercial shipping vulnerable in a sense that it is a tactics that is okay to interrupt this. And I think we've seen uh, the tit for tat coming from Iran. The other impact by all the sanctions now, you've created a, a dark fleet, which I think is over 500 tankers now. And these are tankers that aren't inspected. They don't come into port. They're old. They are uh, dubious flagged. They, uh, they have a lot of problems. They do uh, ship to ship transfers at sea to avoid ports and to avoid sanctions enforcement. So I think there's a there's an impact there, and putting out statistics sometimes about the accuracy of the Houthi targeting and how many are actually connected to Israel, either second, third, or fourth, it seems almost like we're helping confirm their targeting. We should, I think, have a broader message that says we should not attack commercial shipping. And the seafarers, which we haven't really talked about a lot, if you figure that 70 ships are over 70, you figure 20 crew per, you're looking at about 1,400 seafarers that are not trained for this that have already been under attack. It's just the dork fleet. No, Which this is uh, this is a fleet going through the Red oh, Sea. Okay. I'm sorry, right. I've switched to uh, the Red Sea attacks right now. But mm -hmm. And we still have four ships held by Iran off of uh, Bandar Abbas, and some of them have been there for a long time with the crews. And that's the, the big difference is, you know, we did take one of their ships, but it was gone within um, two months, maybe. Uh, and they've been over a year. Uh, they've had the crew of these ships uh, sitting at Bandar Abbas. So, so they're sitting, the crews are sitting on board the ship but can't move and they're not getting paid and... They, yeah, and, and they only get one phone call. They're not treated very well. It's not like home, you know. And right. uh, it, But also, they have been changed out, I should say, uh, finally, through diplomatic efforts of India and Philippines. Um, they did get their, their crews changed out with more, shall I say, um, preferable <laughs> nationalities. Uh, to the Iranians, so it's not like they just let anyone on. They, they, um, you bet these people, um, but they're still there. You know, they're still holding these ships for a year. How long are they going to hold them, and why are they doing so? They've already taken the oil off the ship. Um, what else do you want? <laughs> yeah. So, in in some ways, and I know your group probably worked on this a little bit, but and we talked about this at the symposium. You know, the United States is the recipient and one of the major builders of what we call the international rules-based rules order. Russia and China are seen as two great players that are revisionists in their orientation, and certainly Iran as well. So Iran would like the U.S. out of the region or would ha like to have more control regionally. Um, is that uh, what's at stake in, in I think so. And, uh, you know, we talked earlier about the connection between uh, Iran and its proxies and, you know, part of this uh, axis of resistance that was called, which is trying to reduce overall U.S. presence, especially in the Middle East. We also talked, you know, in the shorter term, you're looking at free flow of commerce, which is at stake. 
in that area, but also the, the credibility of our, our military to do something. But I think in a larger sense, it was brought up that our strategic competitors are watching U.S. actions now to see what our persistence is, to see what our success is. So I think what's happening there is also going to be strategically uh, important. And then finally, you talked about the, the rules-based order, which we stress at sea. I think that the, the West is big supporters of that, and that's what we hope is the, the status quo. But I think some of these other players are not happy with the status quo because it would benefit them more. So I think we're going to see possibly continued attacks against the global supply chain. Uh, does this make other areas more vulnerable? There's lots of choke points around the world, some of them uh, not held by uh, the most reputable uh, nations. So, you know, it's possible this could expand. So those are some of the things that we went over in our group. And I guess in some ways, you hear about the Red Sea, and I think most of our listeners probably isolate that in their minds as a, uh, as a regional area that has its own problems. But really, I don't, maybe in these discussions, I think it's some one thing I took out of the symposium a little bit was you can't isolate this problem set without thinking about the Persian Gulf and perhaps maybe the Mediterranean and what's going on in the Gaza War. Uh, because both of these seas are feeding problems that are we're seeing enacted in the Red Sea, but both of them are closely connected. Uh, can we really see this in isolation, or is it all one large, uh, complicated, wicked problem set? It's a complicated and wicked problem set. <laughs> is a very short answer, <laughs> David. It's a, yeah, you're right. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, with globalization, the world is a much smaller place than now, and it's. You know, what happens in one part of the world has second and third order effects and ripples in anywhere else. And as we said right at the start, you can view the Middle East as sort of the cradle of majority of, uh, of this. Um, and, and you're right, you know, we're seeing impacts that, you know, COVID has a big impact on that area. You know, Russian invasion of Ukraine had a, a big impact on that area because you had reduced grain that led to sort of shortage of food in, in sort of north and western, uh, sort of eastern Africa. Uh, which led to you know, potential problems there as well. So that all feeds in, and then you have you know the Israeli, you know Gaza, you know conversation that's going on at the moment, and that has big impacts. So they're all interlinked. And John made a good point: is that you know this is a global problem, but it's only really us. I say I say us in a general sense, or the Western countries that are trying to do something about it. You know, China is conspicuous by its absence in calling out these attacks on. You know, innocent merchant vessels. Well, you also, I mean, uh, and as the commander of the mm. Combined Maritime Forces, um, you have a lot of these smaller nations that have smaller navies, but many of them are contributing to some of these operations and, you know, the countries in the Gulf on the Arabian side particularly, mm. um, other European okay. states, uh, I'm assuming the Australians, uh, yeah. Japanese, are they yeah, involved, exactly. uh, there, others? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge swath of things in the Indian Ocean or whatever, but I mean, we do have a lot of partnering that yeah. is being done. Yes. What else could be being done? I mean, if we were, if I made all three of you emperor today and uh, we decided, you know, what, what do we want done and what would it take to do some of those outcomes? What, what would you say? Either militarily or economically? Um, well, what, what I'll, I'll we, start with one and then I'll, I'll let uh, uh, the other. So, uh, first of all, I think we've, we've lost the narrative. We don't seem to be winning that battle. The, the narrative seems to be, like I said, we've been able to split some of our partners off because you're with us or you're with Israel. And that, that has been a sticking point. How do we go against that narrative that you're attacking innocent seafarers? Most of them are, are not from UK or US. They're from uh, Sri Lanka, the Phil yeah. Philippines, uh, India. And a matter of fact, I think all the fatalities have been Filipino in the Red Sea, for example. Uh, so that's one, is, is taking back the narrative. We also looked at some ideas on how to get um, the commercial industry more involved. And I'll, I'll have Evan, if, if you could speak to this later. It's not as simple as you would think. They were talking about, can you mount weapon systems or at least uh, perhaps uh, drone jamming systems Jammer or systems, towing them right. onto, or is there a role for private security, perhaps, like there was during the piracy? Um, or at, you know, last August, we were making the announcement, we were considering putting U.S. Uh, security teams, armed security teams of U.S. Marines on board vessels in the Persian Gulf because it had become that level. But again, there's a lot of complications with that. So I think the, the commercial 
uh, side is, is quite limited, perhaps. So I think it's, it's somehow we have to win the narrative that, you know, we should not interfere with commercial, you know, our global commercial network. So I'll, I'll leave it there and let my colleagues come <laughs> in. Um, so it is. It's, it's really challenging, isn't it? If there was an easy answer, I think we, we would definitely have solved it by now. Um, but to pick up on John's point, the, you know, the narrative is so important. You know, we are we naturally focus in on the here and now because of social media. It's the right. immediacy of, of pictures and videos that we see and ship this tack in the Red yeah, Sea yesterday. And, and, right, right. and everyone builds up their own perceptions based on their mm -hmm. own social media feed, which then feeds your perceptions, and it's a vicious yeah. circle sometimes. Um, but I would say if we had, if we all collectively had the ability to to step back and take a sort of a more global view of it, then I think we are we would be in a better position. But then that leads to the value and the power of partnerships in dealing with this as well. Um, but that's a much more than a military military challenge, that's on the political stage. If I go back into the, the, the military world, uh, and John's very you know, eloquently highlighted the, you know, what can be done militarily to protect vessels going through, and it starts to get more complicated and more complicated, but, but all we're doing militarily is solving a symptom or addressing a symptom right. that is happening. So we end up in a almost a mini arms race. So if we, you know, if, if we did put on um, defensive suites onto merchant vessels that could defend against certain threats, then you know, your, your opponent would learn that and develop tactics to get around that. Then you'd have to develop your own tactics to, and you'd end up in this you know, constant arms race of who, you know, who can defend better than the opponent can attack. And because naturally we'd be in the defending state, you're always on, on the back foot. So, so militarily, yes, we can treat the symptoms and provide deterrence and reassurance, um, but that doesn't solve the fundamental problem that is caused on land and within the So we'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, just on the military operational side for a moment, uh, do you see pieces and parts of emerging technologies that will assist us either in big data running through the manifests, um, <coughs> intelligence that would uh, help us there, or I know there was a discussion about convoy operations in our previous uh, panel and some discussion about how that might be a better option to protect shipping through the Red Sea because you have more than one warship and you can use international players to help do that and the merchants would be more assured that they have uh, protection as they move through. What about those two issues uh, when, uh, from yeah. your perspective? Yeah, sir. so from a military perspective, we've been doing convoys of merchant vessels you know, since the First and Second World War. It's something we're familiar with. But it's also something that is very resource heavy and you have to be in, again, the right place at the right time and apply resource to it. And as we all know, warships are expensive, you know, equipment, bits of equipment to run, and they only have a, a certain area that they can control. So either you apply many more resources to the area, which becomes a real sustainability problem for whatever country is doing that. But could you, for instance, move some of the combined maritime forces out of the Persian Gulf and move some of those larger set of vessels into the Red Sea to do some of that work? Would that be an so, option? So, 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 yep, that's always an option, and, you know, and that, that is done on a daily basis. The, the challenge we're looking at there, again, is the, the, the challenge of technology. So to go back to defending a merchant vessel at, ship, at, at sea against a, you know, a drone, which may be moving at 150 miles an hour, is the easiest one, but, but that in itself is difficult because you've got to be in the right place at the right time in a certain ice leaf around the ship to, to provide that protection. Um, and not all countries can do that. Not all countries have the, first of all, the technical ability to do it, but also the political authorizations to, to use kinetic force to protect a, another country's n national flagged asset. So that brings challenges there. Walmart, so go, Walmart goods. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Other countries, exactly. Walmart so, so, yeah, so that's, that's <laughs> that. um, But to go back to your earlier point, you know, then technology is obviously moving on very, very quickly. And then you know, another sort of day job I do, we, you know, work for, we'd look at that high-end technology and how it can do, and there's huge steps being made and advances being made in, in technology, um, and it's moving along very, very quickly. But then, you know, at the moment, as, a, as humanity, we still think that humans need to be in control of that all. That's a big cultural step change that we now need to, to make to, to allow, you know, for want of a better word, AI to sort of take charge of that defensive and that's a huge cultural change we do. The technology is, 
it's nearly there. We, we could do it. Um, but it's a cultural change we need to do as well. And I think that's where a lot of focus is and further focus needs to be. Because we could provide, in theory, technically, we could provide almost like a, uh, a protection area around that without any ships there. That takes investment, it takes political will, it takes you know, cultural change to do. So the technology is there, but I don't think the mechanisms are, yeah. are there yet. So, I mean, we make you the czar of global shipping. Uh, what do you want as a desired end state, and what, what kinds of things should we be working on? Uh, there's, uh, there's really not much for, for industry to do. You know, shipping, ships can't do much when it comes to protection against um, you know, the navies. Uh, other navies, they, we don't even allow private armed guards to go north of, um, no, they don't, they can't go through the Strait of Hormuz because it would, there would be no point. There's no piracy up there. Who are they protecting against? They need to know when they're outmatched and they're outmatched, you know, um, unless we can somehow, <laughs> you know, train uh, private guards to be, you know, military commandos. So again, the, the short-term answer to that is um, push the Houthis away from the coast, uh, destroy launch sites, uh, prevent smuggling of high-tech weapons into Yemen, um, maybe pursue political outcomes in Yemen, which no one wants to stick their hand in that tar baby in some ways, but might be necessary to solve this problem in the long term. Yeah, it needs to be solved on land, I believe. Uh, well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, let's go around the room for any last thoughts. And uh, I'll start with John, and then we'll move on to Evan, and I'll end with Kamro Fryer. So, John, any last thoughts on Yeah, something uh, uh, struck me, which I, I, I neglected to, to speak about, was the, the role of um, our partner states and convincing them to be more involved if... Um, in the national security strategy, national defense strategy, we talk about the U.S. is going to protect rules-based order and commerce with the help of partners. So we need to take the time to integrate partners into that mission, convince them to be on board for that mission. And I think part of that's the narrative. And I also look at, I teach in the international program. So we had 35 countries last year. We're going to have 45 this year. And what can we do as far as professional military education to at least discuss uh, concerns and maybe move us a little closer there. So I think um, the partner thing uh, can't be emphasized enough. Well, I remember when uh, the CNO uh, was here a few years ago, one of the um, previous CNOs, and you know that whole notion of a thousand ship navy. And the idea was not that the U.S. was going to have a thousand warships. It was that we were going to work with allies and partners throughout the world. And I think in some ways, uh, there's a bigger mission for Coast Guard um, training, governance, exercising uh, with other nations around the world, building of that kind of capacity. So these are all very, very important topics. Just uh, so. one, one note on that, believe it or not, the Thousand Ship Navy, when it came out, I was in the Pentagon. They wanted to change the name because there was a concern that if you have a thousand ships, how can you ask Congress to buy any more? So it became some kind of global maritime partnership was another thing. But I, I do think that that concept actually talked about partners, less than allies, and those mission sets where we needed assistance like uh, narcotics, piracy. And by the way, the Indian Navy has really been aggressive against piracy. And that's one mission the U.S. does not have to do. So that's a, a case of where partners come in, help out, allow us to focus on other missions. Thank you. Evan, last thoughts. Yeah, um, again, uh, you know, on behalf of the industry, we really do appreciate uh, all that the Navy does. We appreciate the partnership um, and the Willington willingness to learn uh, between the two. It hasn't happened much in the past, and it is now. So we're really excited about that. Um, other than that, I think that Commodore, you <laughs> you're definitely the expert expert on this. So um, thank you for um, having me participate. I appreciate it. Commodore. So it's a wicked problem, definitely. It's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. And I think um, <clears throat> yeah, we could speak at length about, about it. Um, uh, I think John's point is right. You know, partnerships are so vital in this. And it's not about just expecting your partners to do things. It's you know, allow your partners to play to their strengths and let them do what they're good at and let other people worry about other things as well. And together, 
you can solve you know, a whole multitude of problems. But then to do that, you need the political will, the understanding to do that. So this is bigger than just a, a military problem. You were brought in to provide a solution, but that can only ever be short term. Underneath that, we need to build those partnerships, which I think, you know, you know John and I have worked together before on, on, on this in that area, and there's, there's so much more to do in that area, I think, as well, so that's one thing. Um, but also, at the end of this, I think, you know, don't forget, as John mentioned as well, that there's the humanity aspect, and you know, people's lives are at risk on a daily basis going through the straits. Um, and one thing we didn't discuss is also the potential environmental impact of this. You know, we look at the financial economy, you know, the military aspects, but um, you know, we... We sort of we've not mentioned you know if a fully laden oil tanker was significantly hit in that area, and you look at the maritime geography of the Southern Red Sea, that water doesn't really go anywhere; it stays in the Southern Red Sea. So if you were to um, lose an immense amount of oil, which a single ship can carry in the Southern Red Sea, then that's world news for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. Well, you know we can't uh, we can't ignore our way out of these problems. I'm, reminded, you know, that I, as an army officer, you know, it can always get worse. You know, it's like <laughs> young kind of Frankenstein. Well, yeah. it could be raining and it's, yeah. it starts to rain right yeah. about that time. Yeah. Um, this topic is uh, ongoing, certainly of concern today. I think I mentioned this in our last uh, podcast, but having military and scholarly and I industry experts at the symposium over the last uh, several days and here for today's discussion which has been excellent it's very beneficial we very much appreciate you joining us for this special edition of the Trident the Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf if you are unable to attend our recent symposium exploring maritime strategies the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf this has been the second in a short series exploring some of the outstanding discussions that we had at the symposium and it's been in a extraordinarily informative discussion on one of the most important maritime regions in the world. John, Evan, Commodore Fryer, we truly appreciate you providing your expertise and insights on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Trident a podcast on irregular warfare. Opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, or the U.S. Naval War College. Please find us at www.usnwc.edu backslash C-I-W-A-G and consider subscribing to our bi-weekly newsletter The Patrol or listen to further episodes of The Trident Until next time